The XY Advisor podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. XY Advisor does not hold an AFS license nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Financial advisors help Australians live better lives, and we're great at it. But what about us? For us to thrive in the coming years, I'm here to ask a very big question. How can we live better, run better businesses, and help more clients along the way? My name is Jessica Brady, and I would love for you to join me as I listen and learn from experts who answer these very big questions. I am lucky enough to record most of my podcasts on Gadigal Land. This podcast is brought to you by Challenger, who believe in providing customers with financial security for a better retirement. Challenger's lifetime annuities provide different payment solutions to suit your client's financial circumstances and needs. For income certainty, they can choose CPI indexed or fixed payments. Alternatively, they can choose to have payments linked to changes in the RBA cash rate or investment markets. Challenger can provide your clients with a monthly income for life so they can enjoy today knowing they'll always have income in the future. Today's conversation is with Craig Boss. One of the really big things for me when I started to take on this podcast was to make sure that I can have conversations that I think are really meaningful and important to us as advisors. And one of the big things I wanted to tackle was to destigmatize mental health. The industry surveys have shocking results for us with mental health. And I think the only way to really do it is to talk about it, to properly talk about it. So that's what Craig and I do in today's chat. And so I need to issue a trigger warning because we we cover some pretty heavy stuff. But it's an important chat, a really important chat. And I'm so grateful for Craig to come on and share his story. And I hope that you are too. Hi, Craig. Hi, Jess. How are you? I'm great. I am really excited and I feel very uh, humbled to be having such a very important discussion with you today. And from the very outset, we need to say that today's conversation is going to be quite personal and that it contains information that is pretty heavy. So I should probably issue a trigger warning, but we both discussed this and we think it's vital as an industry that we have more open and frank conversations. And so we hope that you will explore these important topics with us. Craig, before we get into those, I think it's important that we learn a little bit about you and your story. Sure, Jess. Um, So just from a biographical perspective, um, I'm now 57 years old. I was uh, born in South Africa. Uh, grew up there, um, married there, had three children in Cape Town, and uh, emigrated to Australia in 1999. Uh, became uh, an advisor in the early 2000s, the mid 2000s, and have been um, a risk advisor specializing in insurance ever since then. Um, so that's kind of a brief potted history of you know how I got here. Um, but I have a mm-hmm. you know my personal story is. Um, much more complex and obviously much more detailed. Um, but I thought I'd just give some background as to who I am and what I'm here. You know, I brought up my children in Australia. Um, they're all grown up now. They're all either still studying or graduated. Um, my wife is a, uh, a medical mental health social worker. So, yeah, that's us in the industry. Um, okay. I, so I guess that without you having to prompt, I'll probably just launch into a bit of a story of, you know, why I'm here today and um, you know, what I want to talk about and, and the, the mm. things that are close to my heart and dear to my heart. Um, mm. So, um, as I mentioned, I grew up in South Africa. You know, in South Africa in those days was a very conservative society and mm. um, very. I grew up in a very protected environment. Um, but... Uh, from about five years old, the moment I started to enter school, um, I found myself different to the rest of the of the boys, and um, was largely um, ostracised, um, ignored, um, to some extent bullied right from my early school years. Mm-hmm. 
Um, so my school mm -hmm. years were tough. And especially you know, mm. primary school when everything originated and you're trying to form your friendships and, uh, and your social surroundings, um, I, had a, I had a tough time. But I didn't let on that uh, how tough my life was. And I allowed, uh, I, I allowed the people around me to believe that I was happy and that uh, I was enjoying life and that was, uh, and everything was going well. But I was mm -hmm. I was a lonely a lonely boy. Mm -hmm. um, so I used to spend my days uh, a lot by myself, especially as I grew a bit older and my parents became less involved in my day to day social environment. And um, I would spend my weekends, um, you know, riding on my bike out um, near my house um, and, and watching sport. Um, you know, I would just go and watch. There was a sporting club near where we lived, and I would go out and watch. Um, bowls or tennis or cricket um, at the club. And I spent often, uh, you know, Saturday um, afternoon doing exactly that. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about what happened, but one um, Saturday um, I was um, lured into one of the um, clubhouses um, at this mm -hmm. by by a man at one of these at one of the sporting clubs. Um, he 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 offered me some free cold drink. Um, obviously, I took up on the offer. I had no fear or trepidation. Um, I was twelve years old at the mm. time. Uh, he lured me in and mm. he raped me in this mm. in the kind of the back storeroom of this um, clubhouse. At twelve years old, that is a uh, an yeah. I suppose at any point in your life, it's incredibly traumatic. But um, at 12 years old, um, when you're just, you know, probably prepubescent and you're entering, starting to enter, you know, the early stages of being a teenager, um, it, it was um, be, proved to be an incredibly uh, impactful event um, on my life. I mm. never told anyone. Of course. Um, and it is a... Um, I suppose it's a uh, common uh, theme among survivors of sexual abuse, especially male survivors of sexual abuse, that they don't talk about it. Um, they hide it. Mm. Um, and there's all there's feelings mm. of guilt. There's feelings of, you know, what, did I do something wrong? Did I deserve it? There's all sorts of questions which, you know, would take ages and ages to run into that tend to go through your mind. But... Like I had learned all the years before to pretend to be happy, I just I had this place in my head where I could file these things, um, where I could put them mm. and store them and not think about them and not get them and go off into my own world. And that's what I did with this particular mm. incident. I told no one. I didn't tell my parents. Um, I didn't tell authorities. I didn't tell a single soul. Um, mm. I went through my high school years, you know, just – getting on by and I, it wasn't totally unhappy um, and I wasn't totally unsuccessful. Um, I was captain mm. of the swimming team. Um, I did reasonably well academically, not as well as I could have, but reasonably well. And I, I, but I graduated high school with no direction of where I wanted to go and what I wanted to be. I went to university. Um, I started to take various courses, but was I was really searching all the time to find direction, and I was becoming increasingly lost. Uh, I had even fewer friends at university, um, and I just kind of wandered around, going from class to class and doing some, you know, doing things that I enjoyed, but wasn't really getting anywhere. And I was very lucky that my second year of university, I met the woman who would one day become my wife. And at that stage in my life, she literally rescued me because in hindsight, looking back in my early 20s, um, I was already on a very uh, rocky slope downhill. Um, but okay. here came someone who, who, who loved me. She appreciated me. Um, I felt I didn't have to prove myself or be anyone else with her. And... We were together for four years before we got married. Uh, we then moved to Cape Town. We had these three beautiful children and emigrated to Australia. Um, and uh, mm -hmm. soon after we go to Australia, things started to go downhill. 
I made one or two bad business decisions. Um, coming to Australia with three young children, not knowing the place is incredibly stressful. Immigration in and of itself is an extremely stressful exercise. Um, and mm. um, I got into financial trouble. We were struggling for money. Um, we had to sell our house that we had bought um, in order to keep going. And um, mm. life was tough, but I kept going. Mm -hmm. And I it, you know, got involved in the insurance industry. I did quite well. I eventually started my own practice. Um, and besides the fact that there was always financial stress, I, I, did, I built a business. I built a little business. It was a one-man show, but I built it into, into a reasonably good operation that produced a living. And things were going mm -hmm. reasonably well in that regard. But when I got to my 50s, I had probably the quintessential midlife crisis. And I, I won't be surprised if there are other advisors um, in the industry, people like me, who find or found that they've gone through similar kinds of things. So the kids had grown up, um, they were at university, mm -hmm. they uh, or they were working. Uh, my elder daughter had moved overseas to study. Um, I was now left at home. Um, my kids didn't need me as much anymore. Um, I mm -hmm. looked around and saw, you know, my friends and my colleagues um, who, in my mind, were doing better than me, who were further down the road in terms of their financial success than me. Um, they seemed mm. to be... Uh, just generally more successful. Um, and so I did silly things. Well, you know, I got a tattoo or two. And, did you? Um, yeah, I've got a couple. I've got a few. I've got, uh, I've got a, yeah, I've got a tattoo. I've got my wife's name tattooed on my shoulder and I've got my kids' initials tattooed down the other side of my torso. So I, it was just, it was a little bit of rebellion, um, I suppose. Mm. And, you know, equivalent to, you know, I got very involved in my exercise. I was exercising sometimes twice a day, um, anything to kind of reverse the aging process and, um, you know, try and stretch out the years, stay younger. But then other things started to close in on me. Um, the LIF, life industry reforms came in, meant less mm. revenue, mm. Um, less money, then mm. the Royal Commission more compliance, um, which was a hell of a burden, especially to, you know, one man band like me. Um, the, I was then working in under a license uh, of a, of a uh, and the guys who, the guys who owned their own AFSL and I was working under their license. Mm -hmm. um, the, mm. the environment in that office with the, you know, the impending reforms became very um, I wouldn't necessarily say toxic, but they were very stressful. Um, and mm. uh, these guys just wanted me off their license because it was going to cost them a lot more in PI to have insurance. I was looking for somewhere else to go. And I was lucky that I found the current business, who, who Steadfast Life, who bought my book. So they offered to buy my book mm. um, and then employ me as an advisor. But because of my frame of mind where that has turned out to be a really positive thing, I saw mm. it as a failure. So I saw it as having been able to cut it, um, had to sell my business, mm. have been able to be but successful by myself. I have to go back to being an employee again. So because of my thought processes and my sense that I was a failure, um, having to sell the business exacerbated all of that. And okay. I then I got physically very sick. This was in about August 2020, and they didn't know what was wrong with me. Um, took a couple of weeks to find out. We were, you know, imagining the worst, um, and eventually they found out what was wrong. It was treatable. I was treated, mm -hmm. and I was, mm -hmm. you know, I'm subsequently I'm okay. But that whole thing had completely drained me of, you know, any energy that I had. Mm. Just to go back, a couple of years before 2020, I had finally, under one very stressful, very um, difficult day, I came out and I told my wife what had happened to me at age 12. I'd never even told her. 
Um, it was like so. This is the first time you've told anyone ever anyone, about what happened ever, those decades ever, ago. Ever, ever. Mm. It, it was. I'd kept it buried for I don't know how long, forty years, and mm. had never told a single soul. And oh, I remember. Um, I was feeling incredibly vulnerable. We had a spare bedroom. I was lying on the bed in the spare bedroom talking to my wife and I just burst into tears. And in literally I was in the mm. fetal position and I told her through my tears and crying what had happened. To even mm. hear myself say aloud that I was raped was, it, it was traumatic in itself because I'd never said those words out loud. Mm. Following that, I went into therapy. And this is probably mm -hmm. this is probably my first piece of advice that I can give anybody is it's so important to find the right therapist because I didn't. Um, she was a really nice lady wow. and she listened to what I have to say, but I don't think she had the necessary skills. So what was happening was I was opening myself up in these sessions, but mm. she wasn't giving me the tools and skills to deal with with what I was exposing. So it's like opening a wound, but they're not redressing it or not giving me any mm. method to heal. And so mm. my trauma became even worse. So instead of getting better, it got worse. And in wow. September 2020, after about 18 months of therapy that really didn't work, um, I just broke down one Thursday afternoon. And um, mm. I, I live in the eastern suburbs of Sydney. I got into my car. I left a note um, on my on my bed, on our bed, with my wedding ring. Um, and mm. I got into my car. I drove about three o'clock in the afternoon. I drove all the way to North Head in Manly. If anybody knows Sydney, you have to go. I live near South Head. Mm. You have to go all the way around the harbour to the other side to the city through the city to North Head. And the reason I went there was uh, I loved the view from North Head. I think it's the most beautiful view in Sydney. Um, and I had resolved to take my life. So in the car, I had with me an entire bottle of Valium tablets mm -hmm. and half a bottle of whiskey. And I'd done some research. I'd heard that diazepam, which is the drug in Valium, um, by itself won't necessarily do the deed, but combine it with lots of alcohol very quickly, and it certainly will. So um, I got to North Head. I sent out a few texts. Now, in the interim, the family had found out where I, that I wasn't there, that I'd left the house. We were working okay. from home at the time, COVID. Mm. And mm. I, my children who were at home, my adult children, found the note on the bed. They tried to phone me. They phoned my wife. We came home from work. Pretty soon, the entire family and the police were at the house. And I wasn't answering the phone. Um, I had driven, mm. I was driving to North Head with the intention of killing myself. And that was what I was going mm. to do. It's probably worth, it's just, I'll, I'll just tell you a bit more of the story. So I got to North Head. I sent out some texts to some people, including mm. my family. I said, don't try and find me. Um, and I wrote in the text that I have gone to die in looking at my beautiful Sydney view. And because I love the city and that's where I wanted to die. If I was going to die, that's where I wanted to die, looking at that view. Got there, I swallowed mm. the entire bottle of Valium. So just to give it some context, if you have Valium as a pre-med or because you've got a back spasm, doctor will probably give you two milligrams, maybe, maybe four, maybe five, if you're a big person. I took 244 milligrams with half a bottle of scotch oh, God. in the space of about two minutes. Okay. I just drank it like a bottle of water. That last okay. text I sent that I told you about was taken a few was sent a few minutes after I'd finished swallowing the pills and the whiskey, and it just so happened that because I was already drifting off, the last word we were supposed to say "view" came out as "Jim" G Y M, with a lot of different mm -hmm. letters trailing after that. So beautiful Sydney mm -hmm. Jim didn't make any sense, and. At my house was my sister, my daughter, uh, and my sister said she doesn't think that Jim makes any sense. And the police were saying, what does he mean by beautiful Sydney Jim? And my daughter said, well, if it's not Jim, I, it's probably a mistake. He probably means something else or it's autocorrect. He probably means 
beautiful Sydney view. And if he does that, it's definitely North Head because I know he loves it at North Head. So it was just her intuition and her knowledge of me. The police said, okay, we'll give it a try. They called Northern Beaches Police. They rushed to the parking lot. They found me in my car, doors locked, windows closed. This was about five o'clock in the afternoon, quarter past five. Um, I was unconscious. They smashed the window open, dragged me out the car, called the ambulance. I was rushed to Northern Beaches Hospital. I was intubated because my breathing was so shallow, it was about to stop. And the doctors said that I was probably 15 minutes away from dying. Mm. 15 minutes later, and I'd have mm. been dead. But due to fate and my daughter and some clever minds and clever deduction, I was saved. Um, mm. And I, I think it's what, what I want to tell some people, tell people is this. There is this view of suicide that people who take suicide, who commit suicide are selfish or cowardly. And there is this mm. pervasive view. And how could they do this to their children? And mm. how could he do it to his wife? And how could he do it to his parents and his family? There's always those kind of questions. But as a survivor, mm. I can tell you what happens in the mind when you do decide to take your life. You get what's called, the, the psychologists call it cognitive dissonance. Think of it like tunnel vision. Mm. Think of it like you're looking through through a metaphorical straw, and all you see is this tiny dot at the end, and that's the only solution you see. So when you have normal crisis in your life, your mind naturally thinks of about four or five things to try and resolve that particular issue. When you have cognitive dissonance, there's only one thing, and you believe, mm. you truly believe that you're doing the best thing for yourself because it will take away all the pain that you're suffering, and mm. it will, mm. and it's also the right thing for your family because why should they have to bear you? Why should they have to deal with you? The failure, the depressive, the, the, the just the one that causes trouble and pain for them as well. So it's best for everyone if you're gone. And it, you, that's how your mind thinks. That's how you resolve to make such a decision. It, I, I can't speak for everyone who's trying to commit suicide, of course. Um, or those who have been successful. Mm. But this is how a lot of the science is. And as a survivor, this is, I can tell you, how I thought. So mm. You, mm. You, you go and you do the act because you think it's the right thing for you and everybody else. Yeah. Subsequent to that, I was in hospital uh, and then transferred to um, a psychiatric facility. Um, I was very lucky. Mm -hmm. um, my wife... Mm. Um, given the industry that she's in, put me in touch with some amazing, or got me involved with some incredible people, a fantastic psychiatrist, a great clinic, and and he referred me to a psychologist. So the moment I entered the clinic, um, I was diagnosed literally within 24 hours with major depressive disorder. So I've been depressed mm -hmm. now looking back probably all my life, most of my life, and had never mm. been diagnosed or treated. Mm. Ever since then, I've been in therapy and working on my mental health. In fact, only last week, I actually terminated with my, psychi my psychologist. So in the sense that I don't need ongoing therapy, but she's there if ever I need her. Mm. Um, so mm. I took that as a, it's a very positive milestone for me. But... I, the, the purpose of me telling the story, and I don't know if this is a question that might come up, and I know I've been doing a lot of talking, but is that mm -hmm. I, I want to just tell my story to do two things. One, to destigmatize both male sexual abuse, um, which is often very hidden and kept under wraps, as well as mental health in general, especially for males. Because there is this attitude that males have to be strong, that they have to be stoic, that they have to mm. be, um, uh, you know, incredibly resilient, and, and you know they don't talk about these things. And those attitudes still exist. I mean, society is changing in some respects, but it's very much people don't talk, and they're afraid to talk, mm. and they're afraid to seek help, and they're afraid to be vulnerable, and. I'm, I want to destigmatize that, and I want to say that I am now healthy, and I'm happy, and I'm happy to be alive, and that's only because mm. 
I've got the help that I needed. And I was obviously got to the point where I had to get the help. But there are so many opportunities now to intervene earlier and to get the intervention mm. yourself for people to not only, you know, it's all very well to say to somebody, are you okay? But they, generally, most people are going to say, I'm fine, because they don't want to worry you. So there's two sides to that. One, asking, are you okay, is just not enough. You need to go further. If somebody doesn't look okay, they are not okay. And you need to go further than mm. just asking. And the other thing is that if you're not okay, and this is the other side of the coin, mm. go out there and get help. Ask somebody to help mm. you. Mm. That's, uh, I think that's so important. Craig, yeah. it's so important. And, I, th I, you know, to have – to have this conversation today is so, so humbling for me to have someone on who is willing and able to share the darkest corners of what has happened to them. And so you're right, there is a long way to go, but I think the fact that you're able to and want to come here and, and make sure that other people don't feel alone, we know from industry research, Craig, that the advisors of Australia are not mentally well. As a, as a gross generalisation, we aren't for all of the varietal of reasons that we know. You know, we know people have personal lives and histories and uh, we know that there's been so much change from a regulatory perspective and financial stress and, you know, the cumulative or compounding impacts and everyone's story is different. But we can't keep pretending that we can help everyone else and not acknowledge that as a profession, we have so much more work to do to have these conversations so that people know that they're not alone and that they're not a failure and that they're not invalid for having these, you know, human feelings. And so I just want to say before we continue into sort of more pointed questions, a huge thank you. I can't imagine that this story gets easier to tell even though you 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 do tell it so well, um, it's really important that I pause and just hold space to say that it's very brave of you. And I want to say thank you because I know that there will be people who listen right now who feel really grateful for you to share your story. Well, I appreciate that, Jess. I appreciate you saying that. And that's the exact purpose of me doing this. I, I, I just telling my story because I want other people to tell theirs. They don't have to tell it in public, but I certainly want them to tell mm. it to people who care and can help them. Greg, what did you think about the concept of mental health before you were able to really acknowledge what was going on in your world and get help? Did you have any did you have any thoughts around mental health? Did you believe in mental health? I say believe in sort of inverted sort of yeah. I, fingers. Look, like yeah, what, I, I what did, did you think I mean about I grew it? up yeah, I mean, I, my, my wife was involved in mental health, you know, all her career. That was her career. Um, she's a mental health yeah. social worker. That's what she does. So, obviously, I believed in the concept of mental health. But you, the thing is that you think of mental health as, or I did think of mental health as somebody who had a specific condition, right, that was easily mm. identifiable, right? So, mm. that person has got manic depressive disorder and it's easily identifiable okay this person is okay. is depressed and it's easily identifiable so it's like uh chicken pox right you break out in spots all over your face and ah that person's got chicken pox but so you think that mm. mental health issues are easily identifiable but what i've learned is that it is a silent epidemic. It's because mm. you can't really see it. You have no idea mm. um, what's going on in people's minds. You have no idea what's going on in their hearts. You've got no idea what their thoughts are. You know, there's a quote by um, Robin Williams, the, the, the comedian and actor who sadly did take his own life and was successful. And he said, um, you never know what's going on in somebody else's life. So be kind always. So, and that's one attitude that's really changed for me is I've changed this, my mm. entire approach to people to first be kind and then see what mm. happens. And even at work, I'm mm. first kind, you know. So if I'm 
if I need something done or I'm not happy with an underwriting decision or, or you know, something's not happening right, I first try the nice approach, the kind approach. And then if that doesn't work, I go the other route because you never know. You know, if an underwriter mm. doesn't get back to me for four days and I want him to and I need him to speak to him, I don't, I would, in the past, I would have got angry with the underwriter, but I don't know. I don't know what's going on in his life. Mm. Uh, he mm. could be at home with depression. Um, he could have a sick child. Um, his mm. wife could be having trauma in her family. You, you never know. So the default position now is be kind and then can make judgments when you know further. So it, it's just, that's, sorry, I did digress from the question a little bit about oh, that's okay. what did I think of mental health. I'm but, the queen of that. <laughs> but it, it does, it, it's, it's really important um, as a society that we are kind in the first instance, that we are compassionate mm. in the first instance, that we give pause to understand first before we go crazy and angry and aggressive and judgmental. And your point earlier is an interesting one that I've just been thinking about. You know, it's wonderful that we have, we have actually come a long way as a society in, in terms of talking about mental health and we have things like Are You OK Day? But to your point, it can become a little bit tokenistic and as we live increasingly busy, frantic, frenetic sort of lives where we're racing around to actually pause and to stop and to say to someone, Hey, are you actually, are you actually okay? Like, tell me what's happened. Something doesn't feel right. You know, it takes courage to even have those conversations and it takes space to have those conversations. And it's probably something that each of us just need to be reminded of how important they could be for the person that you're having that conversation with. And no matter how busy and tired and, and crazy life gets, taking those moments to check in on your team, your staff, your family, and your friends. Very, very important. Yeah, I agree with you, Jess. And, and I'll make two points on that. One is that, you know, with the new um, hybrid uh, working models that some people working from home and some people working in the office, we're actually coming into less contact with people. So there's less opportunity to mm. check in than there was before. And people mm. are now at home. Mm. And if home is the source of all their problems or the source of where their anxiety mm. and stress is, there they are at home in that environment 24-7. And they never get to escape it. Um, also, they have le less and less interaction with people who could say, wait a minute, you don't look right. Are you okay? Mm. Can I help you? What can mm. I do? Let's have a conversation. And I think that that... Mm. You know, we are a naturally sociable people. But, uh, human beings are. Mm. Um, we, we are mm. sociable. We interact. We've always built societies since the beginning of humans. So to now have societies where we are distanced and we're separated and we can't see body language and facial expressions, it, it you know, even the color of somebody's skin, it, it, it's, I think that there is a massive impact on that. To the other point I want to make is that you spoke about checking in on somebody else. I think it's really important for us to check in on ourselves. Okay. How often mm. do we actually pause and think and say, wait a minute, I'm angry or I'm aggressive or I'm sad or, but why? And mm. if it's something you're entitled to, you're entitled to be sad or angry sometimes. These are normal human emotions. But if you've, you've got to check in on yourself, you've got to say, am I okay? Am I really feeling okay? Mm. Is there something wrong? Am mm. I happy? And I'm not talking about whether you, you know, you've got a sore knee or a, or a fever. I'm talking about your mental health. Check in on yourself. There's nothing wrong with mm. doing that. And think it's very important. And that's one of the techniques that I've used um, is, is to check in on myself. I mean, at the beginning of my therapy, it was almost constant. I was almost exhausted from checking in on myself all the time. Now I've learned... Mm to do it more subconsciously. Um, but yeah, ask yourself the question and be honest with yourself. If you're not okay, say, yes, I'm not okay. And then do something about it. Don't just ignore it. Don't just ignore it. It's like cancer, depression. Yeah, okay. Depression can be like cancer. So if you, if you ignore it, it just grows. And the longer it grows, the harder it is to fight. So if you get it early and you recognize that 
you know, you're not feeling right. And, and it's not only depression, other mental illnesses as well. But um, if you check in on yourself and if you don't feel right, go and get help. And the sooner you get it, the better. And if the first therapist isn't the right one for you, find another one, huh? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, it, you know, it's, it's, it's like the first tablet, you know, where some one antibiotic might not work, go find another one. Um, you might not, you mm. might not get on with one particular GP, go find another one. It's the same thing with a therapist. In fact, it's even more important with a therapist. So um, mm. find mm. the right one. Um, and uh, one of the key things about therapy, and I learned this, is you have to be honest in therapy. You have to be honest with your therapist and you have to be honest with yourself. If you lie to yourself and you lie to the therapist or you don't tell the truth and the whole truth, then it's not going to work. Um, and you'll come away, mm. ah, the, the therapy didn't work for me. Mm. I think if your therapy mm. doesn't work for you, you're probably not being as honest as you can be in therapy. You need to be. It's brutal. It's brutal. And it and, and, and brings up another point. You have to really work hard at being mentally well. Um, you know, I, I train every day physically for an hour. So I do an hour of train workout every single day, Sundays included, mm -hmm. every single day. And that's part of my mental health program. I like to feel physically healthy, it makes me feel mentally healthy. But you need to actually train yourself to think right. And it's hard work. Mm. It's hard work, especially if mm. the neural wires in your brain have been wired wrong for so long and you need to rewire them. That takes a lot of work. It's a lot of work. I've worked for 18 months now, really hard to rewire my brain and my thought processes. And it's, it's not easy. And it's, there's no easy fix to mental health. It's not going to come from just taking an antidepressant. I do, but it's not going to, that's not, that what in and of itself won't help. You can't just take medication mm. and think you're going to be okay. You have to work at it mm. just like anything else. And, but it, if you do, you will be successful and you will be healthy again. Greg, I have one last question before we get into some mm. rapid fire mm. pieces. I, I want to talk yeah. about that point that got really dark and really hard and where you started to see very few options. Do you think the people around you and knowing that it was, it was COVID, so this is probably a hard question to ask, but mm. I think the piece around looking at yourself is very important but I also want to know, is it easy to spot for someone outside or is it, is it, is it so hard to notice behavioral changes? Like when you look back do people say to you that they could see something wasn't right, were there a lot of signs? Was this something that, I think it's on a do you know what I'm asking? Basis. I know what you're asking. Um, can you spot when you, somebody who gets to that point in your life, you know, having spoken to, other people who have tried to commit suicide or be with them in, in group therapy and um, or you know, things. It, it, you know, some people you can see them becoming very, very depressed. You can you can actually see mm. it. But mm. sometimes that switch over is so insignificant, so small, so quick that you know people might be depressed, but then that often the decision to actually, okay, now I'm going to do it, is just there and then. Others plan mm. these things and they plan to do it for a long time and they see no outs, but a lot of people disguise it. A lot of people, you don't see mm. it. So it's not like we'll just mm. keep your eye out because there's no, there's no telltale signs. I mean, if you know somebody really well, you might see some changes in their behavior. I mean, there are the traditional um, what we know about people who become extremely depressed, they become reclusive. They um, may not want to get up in the morning. They uh, drag themselves out of bed. Their appearance becomes, you know, they don't take care of their appearance. There are what we know, they're textbook signs of depression. But you're asking about that moment. One decides to, well, now I'm, I'm going to do it. No, I don't think it's that easy to spot. I think it's it's... It's very, very difficult to spot, in fact. Mm, okay. Because you and I had a conversation when we were planning for this, and we sort of said that we want to use today to create meaningful conversations around something that is not often talked about. And we also said that we want to have conversations that people possibly are too afraid to ask because you are now starting to talk about this more and more in your quest to help other people feel 
less alone in their journey. And, and I think also as a message of hope and as a beacon of hope that in a relatively short space of time, Craig, you can go from the place that you were in to where you are right now, which seems like you've done, my goodness, you must have done and continue to do quite a lot of work. And that's so commendable. Um, and I want to say a huge thank you to you. Is there anything else before we get into the rapid fire questions that you want to leave our listeners with today? Uh, look, I was very lucky um, in, in my case to have um, the wife and my wife and kids. My wife was absolutely incredible. And, and, you know, I don't think I would have been able to be as well as I am now if it wasn't for her support. She's She's been incredible. Mm. And um, I'll be forever grateful. You know, she rescued me when I was 21 or whatever, and she rescued me again now. So um, I owe her mm. my life, I literally do. But um, nobody is completely alone. Um, and if you don't have your wife next to you or somebody who will do that for you, there are amazing people um, who work for organizations like Lifeline and Beyond Blue and other organizations where they are incredibly compassionate, caring people who will care. They do care. Mm. And um, mm. you can get the love and support that you need. Um, to, it, it takes a lot of work to be mentally healthy, but the the ben but but it's worth it it's worth the effort absolutely i think that's a good note to end on other than me asking you a few rapid fire questions if you don't mind sure go ahead i mean the first one these are the same every week okay the first one is going to be interesting given the conversation that we've had today <laughs> yeah. and that is what do you do to look after your mental health um I'd say there's probably a four-pronged approach. One is exercise. The exercises are really important. Mm. Uh, and there's a lot of research, um, tons of research to say that physical health is linked to your mental health. Okay. So mm. um, very quickly, when you exercise, you release endorphins uh, in your body. Endorphins are a natural hormone, but they're also linked to morphine. Okay. Makes you happy. Okay, so exercise, mm. release the endorphins. You've got happy horno hormones running around your mind and your brain. That's number one. Number two, mm. I use mindfulness a lot. So um, mm -hmm. it's, mindfulness is not some, uh, you know, hocus pocus or religion or kind of some kind of cult. Um, it's just a technique. And if you learn to do it, um, and again, it's, again, you work and you learn how to do it, it's a great way to check in on yourself to detach from the stresses around you and just um, recenter yourself. Um, mm -hmm. The other thing is the self check-in, which I mentioned earlier. I do check in on myself. Am I okay? I just ask myself that question. And if I'm not, mm -hmm. accept it. Acceptance is a big part. So you're not okay. That's fine. It's okay to mm -hmm. be not okay. And then if you can find the source of it, think through it, logically. The third thing, uh, the fourth thing is, I try and balance my lifestyle. I hate the term work-life balance because work is part of life. So it's not working and living. Work's part of life. You know, it's a mm. huge part of our lives. Mm. So I just talk about I balance my lifestyle. Um, when I'm at work, I work. Yeah, you know, if I'm at work and I'm stressed and I need to take time out, I'll just go walk around the block. There's nothing wrong with doing that. Mm. You know, just go walk around the block, clear your head, get out of the office, get mm. some fresh air, that kind of thing. And mm -hmm. yeah have a social life, find other interests, look for things, get involved in things you're not interested in, right? learn to paint, learn to sing, you can go to ceramics classes, mm -hmm. go play, go visit museums on the weekend, get involved in movies, join a book club, whatever you, that sparks your interest, do something else, the outside mm. of work. Yeah, so just balance your lifestyle, be sociable, do sociable things, you know, take yourself off to coffee Absolutely. shops or restaurants, even if you do it by yourself, get out into society. Go to a movie yes. by I'm yourself. There's nothing wrong with it. Yep. No, and then you don't have to share the popcorn. I'm quite an advocate of that. <laughs> uh, what's <laughs> These days you don't share popcorn. There's not COVID-19. You know, you don't. Oh, see, I just go by myself. Don't I don't popcorn. even know that. Nobody else puts um, your hand in the book. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's very true. Uh, what is yeah. a piece? <laughs> what's a piece of advice that you would give your younger self? Get help sooner. Just get help mm. as soon as you can. As soon as mm. you feel you need to get help. Mm -hmm. Yeah, ask for it. Don't be afraid to ask for it. Don't be too proud. Don't be too brave. Uh, do you have something that's big on your bucket list that you're yet to tick off? 
Um, look, my wife and I love to travel. Um, and I'm a huge foodie, so I cook and I love to cook and I love food. So what I'd love to do is take um, a few months off and drive around Italy and France. So no coach travel, no nothing, just drive and experience the food and the scenery and the wine and, and the culture that way. Italy and France, so that's, I, need, I want to drive around at my own pace. That's a goal. Sounds amazing. Amazing, amazing. And my last question for you today, Craig, is do you have a book for me to read as part of my fake book club? It's um, when I grew up, when I was growing up, there's, there, was a, there was a comedian, a British comedian called Spike Milligan. Now, a lot of people don't know who he was. He was um, part of a revolutionary group uh, called The Goons. And they used to have a thing called The Goon Show uh, on BBC Radio um, that I used to listen to. But Spike was a fantastic guy. And only many years later did I realize that Spike was actually a uh, serious depressive. But he writes the most hy hysterical memoirs of his time in, in the British Army during the Second World War. And there are about six volumes of his memoirs. And it's written very comically about what he went through and his stories of being a soldier in the war. And I used to read them over and over and over again, and I never knew why I had some kind of connection with this guy. And only when I read his biography years later did I find out that he suffered from depression all his life. Um, so I think there was some kind of connection. But even today, I read Spike Milligan's uh, memoirs. I've got the, these dog-eared paperbacks, and I still read them. And, um, yeah. They are a light relief, but deeply insightful. Craig, mm. I very genuinely, very heartfeltly want to say a very, very big thank you for coming on today and sharing your story. And as I said before, it requires a lot of bravery, a lot of vulnerability, and a lot of courage. We need to have more of these styles of conversations as a profession because you are not sadly alone in in the situations that you've been through and you know your your um need for help and the more that we can normalize this the, the better we're going to be as people so thank you for being today's guest thank you jess and thanks for the opportunity and thanks for the great work that you guys and that xy advisor are doing for the industry mm -hmm.